Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Melody Patry. I am the Advocacy Director at Access Now, and it is a great honor for me to be joined today for this fireside chat by Niklas Zenstrom, uh, who most people know as the co-founder and CEO of Skype, and who is now the CEO of Atomico, um, one of Europe's leading uh, PC firms. Hi, Niklas. Great to be here, Melody. So let's dive uh, immediately in. The reason why actually uh, we're speaking through screens and why we're having RightsCon online this year is a response to COVID-19 and, and, and the pandemic that went the pandemic. So ourselves at Access Now, we had to adopt new tools and, and be innovative and, and find technologies that would be suitable for, for an online summit. And we're not the only ones who had to seek solutions and technical solutions um, as a response to COVID-19 around the world. A lot of governments have tried to adopt various tools and various apps, uh, especially tracking apps as a response to the pandemic to do preven prevention measures, but also um, immediate response to, to the pandemic. I was wondering for you as you know, you invest in lots of companies. What has been your immediate response to COVID-19? So um, as, as, a, as an investment firm, what we did when when uh, the pandemic hit us, in, in so we're based in the UK. We, uh, first of all, we locked down and uh, started to work from home two weeks before the lockdown. And I think for us and, and for a lot of other, actually most tech companies and other investment firms I've been speaking to, that switch to working from remotely was so seamless and remarkably seamless. And uh, so our first focus was safety of our team um, to make sure everyone was safe and could work from, from home. Secondly, uh, was our portfolio companies. And we engaged with all our portfolio companies. And I think that we probably had more board meetings in three months than we had in three years. And we advised all our companies to uh, do whatever they could to um, also to have this kind of a three-stage approach to focus first on the team, secondly, on their business, and third, also what they can participate in society to help combat this 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 um, pandemic. So um, it, it was very much about these companies to help them to preserve cash to uh, extend the runway because these companies are typically non still burning money. They're not profitable because they're early stage growth companies. So they're dependent on raising new funds. And, and when the market is turning down, investors are usually shying away. So it's critical for the survival of these tech companies, these startup companies. We're not talking about the big, big tech giants. We're talking about start, young startup companies to preserve their cash so they can uh, last longer without raising more capital. So that was the first thing we, we did with them and and ourselves. And, and then the third thing that we did was also both as a firm, but also through our companies, start to think how can we engage in the society to combat the, um, the crisis situation that we were all finding ourselves in. And, and uh, you know, part of that is, of course, is just to, to biggest possible uh, extent possible to work remotely to help to stop the spread, the viral spread, uh, which we did. And the other one was like thinking through how can we then proactively work? What are the companies that we have investments in that can actually help to do positive things that to combat um, uh, uh, the crisis? Thank you. So did you notice a, a spike in interest and in, like, have you been approached by more companies that had maybe like a, a focus on, on fighting the pandemic or did you yourself uh, look into the companies you were already investing in um, and see what, what were the solutions available there? Yeah, so there are two things there. One was that we certainly, most what we did was work with our companies that we are investors in. So we typically are on the board of these companies. We are not minority, we are minority investors. So we cannot tell them what to do. We can only advise and, and encourage them. So that's what we did. And a few of our companies actually did a lot of things that are great that we were very proud of. And, and as an example, AccuRx, which is a company in the UK, which are now in um, 
uh, I think majority or almost a majority of all uh, GP practices providing messaging service, they quickly launched uh, a telehealth uh, video consultation service so that it enabled GP practices in the UK to do uh, remote um, consultation. Now, obviously, this was not for primarily for COVID, but as a, one of the challenges that healthcare system had when they had to focus on COVID as a normal health practice, primary practice and other practices had a setback. So providing telehealth was a great thing. Another example was um, FarmDrop is another company in, in the UK, which is providing a marketplace enabling consumers to buy produce uh, food from local producers, from local farmers, local fishermen, local um, uh, bakers and so forth. And when we had the lockdown and supermarkets had empty shelves, it, it really proved out that the global supply chain was for food was in, in a bit stressed out, but farm drop really could really, really increase the capacity at the same time, provide food for, for people in the UK or primarily London, as I must say, but also, also provide a livelihood for those um, farmers who then could continue to provide even more uh, food. Um, another example is um, uh, Scalpy, which is a company that is um, um, helping big enterprises with managing their supply chain. And they actually kind of did a lot of uh, product innovation to help um, uh, to provide a, a global a database for, for companies to, to find other um, suppliers. Obviously, the whole supply chain was a bit challenged. And another one is not a uh, health company, uh, ZocDoc in New York, which is a marketplace helping people to find doctors. They also switched on telehealth and had a huge spike in, in, in telehealth practices. So, so that's kind of the primary things we did with our portfolio companies. The other thing that we saw was that, and, and not only us, but all I guess all tech investors saw that there's, you know, the, I think the first kind of assumption when, when we're entering this new situation, and of course, it's also becoming a, a demand is is in in general uh, decreasing. But what happened was that there was a huge shift to digitalization and to online, both from enterprises and from consumers. So there was a lot of companies which are benefiting from that, and I'm sure most people have seen you know now they're certainly used to a comp you know something like zoom that maybe not so many people used before but that's a company which is a good example of a huge beneficiary of 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 uh, uh this kind of pandemic and the lockdown so there is actually for investors specifically for venture investors like ourselves this actually represents a huge opportunity to invest in companies that are accelerating kind of online and, and remote working and, and also uh, remote kind of e-commerce and other other ways to kind of communicate remotely. So so those are the things that are being on the kind of, I would say, kind of the silver lining for someone like us. Yes, connectivity is a big theme this year at, at RiceCon, especially access to, to yeah. the internet. Um, it's it really interesting. Some of the examples that you brought in um, are direct I would say collaboration or partnerships between mm -hmm. private companies developing uh, specific tools um, and governments, uh, in this case, like health ministries or, or the, the branch of government responsible for, for health and access to healthcare. I was wondering yeah. because so many things uh, happen in a really accelerated way, as you said, and, and we rushed sometimes to some solutions. Some of them with little oversight uh, when it came to respect for privacy and, and compliance with mm -hmm. other human rights. What really can people do and, and uh, in response to, to those partnerships between companies and, and governments? And yourself, you said like you, you're, you're often like a, a minority shareholder, stakeholder in mm -hmm. those companies. But is there a way for you to, to influence or what is your approach when it comes to ensuring um, that privacy and other rights are respected uh, yeah. in those in those kind of government company partnerships yeah yeah so i you know so think about that question i think it's it's actually not a big difference whether a service is provided for through you know through governments or um, to to end users or directly 
from the company itself, the tech company itself. I think that we all need to ensure that privacy is respected. And and um, so if you think about if you think about the tech company that normally would provide their, their services directly to to the consumers, we need to ensure that as a society we have. Uh, uh, a system in place to keep check on on these companies so that that uh, the rights of of, of uh, citizens are protected, and I think that is exactly the same that needs to apply whether that service is provided through a government procurement and uh, and you know and and paid for by uh, taxpayers' money. So I don't think that there need, should be a, a separate system in place. I think that we all have responsibilities. Whether we have, we certainly think that we have a responsibility as an investor and and as a, as a usually we are board members of these companies to ensure that these companies are considering uh, privacy and other kind of rights for for its end users and and other stakeholders. Yeah, no, that's right. And and when we see actually in the categories of of most used apps uh, in, in response of the pandemic, one of the most um, the, mo the most popular applications that were used were mostly voice and video chat. So you created mm. Skype. What was your reaction when you saw all of this happening? And, and did you think that the sector was ready? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's just that um, when, we, when we launched Skype, long time ago now in in uh, 2003 and then we launched a video in in uh, early 2004 i think we didn't know if if that was too early for video but it turns out that it was a great timing for video and we certainly enjoyed a lot of success and we had you know hundreds of millions of people using skype for video calling all around the world and it really connected people and and, and brought people together so that's something that I'm certainly very kind of proud of, and what we have seen now is just the kind of um, the next wave of demand for for um, for for video, and where I would say before the lockdown, video was used maybe more as an alternative, so as an alternative way to to meet the, where the people's primary way to meet was always in person, and we got on an airplane or we drove a car. We were stuck in traffic and we were in, in public uh, um, subways and buses and, and whatsoever and, and wasted both time and, uh, and, um, and carbon emission to meet. What happened in the lockdown was that there was a flip where the primary way to meet is vi via video. And now it becomes a very rare thing to meet in person in real life. So that's what has kind of really kind of made a big big step change but we wouldn't be able to do this if the infrastructure was not ready for it and you know whether you're using zoom uh, meet uh, hangout um, teams or skype or any other facetime whatsapp video etc none of these would work if if Video was not something that was very, very popular. Video communication was something that was very popular for you know 10, 15 years. And it wouldn't work if the internet wasn't built out with this massive infrastructure. And I think certainly I was surprised and many others were surprised that that the kind of the last mile of the internet didn't kind of break down in terms of, of, of uh, congestion because there were so many people sitting at home doing video calls. So, in a way, we're very fortunate. In a way, it's like if this pandemic would have happened 15 years earlier, we would struggle as a world economy because we didn't have the cloud. Remote working wouldn't really work at all, and you know the capacity for video calls would not be sufficient. So, so now we have such a great infrastructure, so that it just and the other thing that most of us are finding out that it's so much more efficient, um, and. Uh, we can work from where we want to work um, and it's, it's more efficient to have video meetings. But I would also say that the other thing that at least I realized is that a value, maybe more in-person meetings uh, uh, to get together in depth, to get to know people and to, you know, to, to bond and build strong relationships. And I think also when you really want to be creative 
it's probably nothing is better than, than getting together in, in, in person. So when you talked about, um, you know, like the, the fact that everyone was moving to, to video calls, you also mentioned the demands and the expectations that people yeah. had when, when they turned to those tools. I know that this community is particularly interested or, or, or one of its um, fierce demands is towards encryption. And as privacy mm -hmm. advocates, you know, like we, we're almost asking sometimes developers to, to build tools with encryption by default or, or really strong privacy settings by default. Yeah. I'm not just talking about Skype, I'm talking also about like all of those new tools, those that are new, mm -hmm. those that, that don't exist yet. What are your thoughts towards you know, encryption and, and really strong privacy by default when, yeah. when, you, when you innovate? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's a really, really important question. And I think the reality with the internet, even from the beginning, when I started, you know, early on in my career and I started, you know, uh, the internet was always an insecure network. You have to assume that whatever you're transmitting on the internet is available for anyone to tap into, whether that is a government or a hacker or just, you know, whoever is having, you know, downloading some tools and sniffing your Wi-Fi network. And in the early days of the internet, there was a big criticism uh, from the telecom industry that it was an uncontrollable network that, that was very anarchic, there was no governance. And always the way from the early on, the way to provide privacy was end-to-end -end encryption. And that is still the way to provide Privacy today is end-to-end -end encryption. So anyone who wants to stay private and want to have private conversations or private messages without anyone eavesdropping on it needs to have strong end-to-end -end encryption. Um, and that's just a very, very fundamental thing so that if you don't have end-to-end -end encryption, you're just going to have to assume that someone is have the ability, and if they have the ability to do, probably will potentially listen into you. The thing that has changed um, over the last 10 years or so was that um, in the old days was maybe that it was maybe someone wanted to tap into you because they wanted to, they were interested in what you were saying because actually just to kind of actually to eavesdrop. Today, it's been a commercial benefit to tap into where you are, who you are, what interests you have, you know, how you feel. So there's a huge industry today, advertisement industry, that is benefiting from collecting information about you as an individual. And that's the big difference from, from in the old days. So I think we just need to kind of separate these two different things that when you think about there's private communication and there is an industry that is benefiting from knowing about you to serve your ads, to provide services to you that you don't pay for. Thank you. Um, and actually speaking about like ads and how we protect ourselves from, from ads or whether we want ads or we don't want ads and what kind of ads we want. In We're both in Europe uh, where there are strong uh, privacy and, and data protection regulation some detractors to, to this regulation are saying that it's killing innovation or that it's preventing innovation. And recently, mm -hmm. we at the same time, we've seen backlash from practices in US and Chinese tech groups because of their lack of consideration for privacy, for data protection and, and, and human rights in general, but also for, for diversity. Do you think that, mm -hmm. first of all, is this... Is this um, I want to call it a myth that, that protecting human mm. rights prevents uh, innovation. So is this myth for you? I mean, you, you, you innovated, you yeah. founded Skype, uh, yeah. you, you yeah. invest in, in very ambitious programs and, and projects. So do you think that there is a real antagonism between innovation and human rights? Yeah, I think it's, it's a very important question. And it's very easy to say, to say to make that blanket statement that that oh, all these privacy laws, whether that's GDPR or or others, that are uh, stifling innovation, and use that as a blanket statement for doing whatever you want to do as a company. 
we, um, I think, because if, if that's the kind of approach that we have, I think we're in very, very dangerous territory. And I think that's not okay. Um, we did a survey. So we, we issued this report, State of European Tech, uh, each year, end of each year. And um, we did a survey a year and a half ago among founders in uh, uh, te of, of technology companies in Europe. We asked them if they thought that GDPR was hindering them uh, to pursue their business objectives. And the other thing we asked them was that if they thought that GDPR was a good thing uh, for society. And there were more people who responded that they thought that G and P uh, founders, so leaders of companies, CEOs, who responded that they think that GDPR is a positive thing is, is, uh, for society. There were more people who answered yes to that than the uh, CEOs who answered that it was stifling their uh, innovation or their um, progress for their businesses. So it's very, very rare that we hear from any company when we invest and we work with these companies that they say that you know privacy is privacy regulation is is um, stifling what they do in terms of progressing their their business now i would say when we think about um um i would say that the the other point i would say here is that when we come to big data and we talk think about uh, ai and machine learning there's a lot of amazing um, solutions that can provide it and that will be provided by machine learning and artificial intelligence. I was thinking specifically in healthcare, in preventing, you know, in, in producing treatments for diseases. One of our companies, uh, Helix, is using machine learning to find treatments to rare diseases, which are have too small patients group for big pharma to provide uh, solutions for. Now, because of privacy laws in terms of how much companies can access health data that is being protected by um, privacy laws, I think there there is something to be done in terms of making that data available in a way that is completely protecting individuals' privacy. So I think there is something to be done there. Uh, but I think it's really important when we, whatever we do, is that we make sure we're protecting people's privacy. And and I would say also that if you take that other kind of that the first statement, like well, if there's no regulations, we have we can access whatever data we have, then then we're going to be um, have competitive advantage. Now, China is going to win that game because they they have um, uh, different uh, set of rules around this and they also have a huge database of, of, of people. I think that's the game that I don't know if founders, certainly in Europe, really want to play. And I think that taking the high road here and saying that whatever companies that are being being built are there to you know to to honor um, data privacy and human rights. I think those are the companies that will be built in Europe. And I think Europe will take a leading role in those kind of companies because our heritage, how we know, how we think about privacy, how we think about respecting human rights. I think we have a leadership role there. But I also think that I'm certain about that the companies that are successful specifically in tech are the ones that can attract and recruit the best talent. And studies shows that uh, talent in tech wants to work for companies which are ethical and which have an ethical approach. So I think that if you're taking like an unethical approach to this and say like, well, we, we're not going to respect privacy, you're not going to be able to attra attract the best talents in, in volumes. So I think it's a competitive advantage. I also think that customers are more and more uh, starting to think about these these issues as well. So companies which are respecting privacy will eventually be uh, more attractive to uh, customers than consumer. Today, that's not the case. Today, convenience wins over over our our, our concerns, and 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 we do we, because it's so difficult today 
to use operate online if you want to use products that fully are respecting you know uh, privacy rather than thinking of you as an individual as a product yes i think the the human rights advocate in me uh, jumped a bit when i heard you say uh, china is going to win this game <laughs> but uh, but i think you're right we we see that increasingly companies have to listen to to the people that are using uh, their products and their tools and we've seen in europe already how the demands have have um have increased and and especially actually like during covid if we make a, a comparison between the countries that have adopted um tracking apps for example for for covid mm -hmm. the the most popular apps have been the ones that were privacy respecting when they when they had also been in ireland um uh, um some education and some dialogue about what what the app would do and would not be able to do as opposed to in other countries i know that in france for example the the app was a disa disaster and and uh, the take-up was was really low so hopefully mm. i want to remain uh, hopeful that um strong privacy regimes and, and regulation can offer um solutions and that also the more that people will be familiar and used to to having these rights protected and respected by companies the more companies will have an incentive to to apply them i know that a lot yeah. of people in in the chat have some questions there is one more question that i could not not ask you uh today and, and then i will follow up with some of uh people's question is because already since the the beginning of rightcon uh we've heard lots of criticism of the the tech's role in reproducing racist and discriminatory power structures yeah. in the digital age and in in, yeah. in a way like the, the vc community we could say has failed to fund and to support non-male and and minority or underrepresented founders yeah. although i think prominent firms have, have scrambled uh over the last couple of months I know that um, this is not a new issue um, to Atomico because you you have your own diversity policy. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you a bit more, like what, what are your thoughts with regards to yeah. to these discussions, and what are your steps towards a more equitable funding environment? Yeah. Yes. No. It's it's a huge problem, and and it's been a huge problem for a very long time, and it's something that the industry is starting to wake up to. Um, and it started with diversity and inclusion with regards to gender with the Me Too movement when the tech industry started to look at itself. And we certainly did and say like, we haven't done a good job. Um, there are, most founders are white males who gone to like good universities. Um, there's there's a clear uh, bias towards yeah towards man and towards white man, which is not okay at all. And I think from so we we just need to acknowledge as as an as an industry we we have not done a great job at all. And and but that's not a reason to continue to not do a good job. We as a firm we we kind of woke up to this you know, with, with the Me Too movement. And I always thought, and I know that we, all of us in our team are very open-minded, growth mindsets, and try not, not at all to have any kind of biases. But by just continuing the practice that everyone has done, you use comp you, you, you're you um, repeating uh, an ecosystem which has been built by, uh, primarily by white men who went to good universities. So when we founded Skype in 2006, the kind of the founding kind of thesis that we had was that great companies will come from everywhere. And the, when we thought about that then, it was not that great tech companies does not have to come only from Silicon Valley, because back then in 2006, that was the case. And we thought we proved to some extent that, that you can build an international company from Europe with Skype, and, and we had a conviction that um, founders are talented people, and talented people just like talented musicians, uh, painters, artists, poets, writers, uh, athletes, they are born around the world, and they're born 
in from all different ethical ethnical um, backgrounds. They're born in all different social backgrounds. They're born in all different genders. So while we didn't think about this, that the great companies can come from everywhere, we thought about that initially just as geography. But now we're realizing that just need to be extended to any kind of group of, of uh, founders. And when we think about it that way, we're realizing that, wow, there's such a big u- universe of talented founders that we haven't really done a good job tapping into. So we kind of, when we thought about this more and more, not only did we realize that it's just the right thing to make sure you're, you're, you have a strong policy and, and a plan to, to, to make your firm and your investments more diverse and, and be more inclusive, it's actually a really good business because a few things is that we know that from studies that diverse teams make better decisions. And as an investment firm, it's all about making investment decisions. And if we were all... All of us who, may, who look at investments, if we were all very similar, we would lose many perspectives. So having people from different ethnical backgrounds and, of course, also different genders will make us better investors. Studies, Numerous studies also showing that diverse group of teams um, are performing better as companies. So it's just much better business to, to really, really think through diversity and in- inclusion. So... We've been, you know, for a few years, we were much more focused on on gender and we set objectives for ourselves, both in our team, to make sure that we have a team uh, that is uh, diverse. And today we have 50% of our investment team is is females and 50% men. So we've come a long way there. But I think on on ethnical background, we're not there yet. So that's that's kind of the other things that we we have to make an effort on. So what we can do as an investment firm, we can make sure that our team is more diverse. And we can also make sure that when we are investing in companies, we really think through, we have diversity and inclusion as as a parameter when we're looking at companies. And also kind of looking at, are these founders really taking diversity and inclusion serious? And then we can work with our companies, portfolio companies also for them very early on to set diversity and inclusion policies and strategies in place, and then give them toolkits to, to make that happen. And the third thing we can do is to engage with the grassroots stages of, of the of the ecosystem. So what we're doing now, we're working with a few grassroots organizations in, in, in Europe, which are helping uh, founders from different backgrounds to, to learn and to encourage them how to, to, to build companies. This is something that is not going to be a flip of, over you know, over a day, it's going to take some time to to get there. But it's it's a, uh, I'm very encouraged to see. Like we're not like you know, I talk about what we can, what we do. But I see so many other firms, and again, I think this is really where the European firms are having a step ahead compared to you know our peers and other other geographies. Yeah. So we just need to keep banging that actually an equitable yeah. environment is better for business. <laughs> And and if you want a, yeah. a, a important return for your money, you need you need to take those steps that that you have mentioned yeah. to to pro- not just to promote but actually uh, walk the walk the walk in terms of um, yeah. diversity and inclusion. I promised that we would uh, answer some of the questions that have been put forth in the in the chat. So I'm just going to read to you one question, which refers to our our previous uh, question about end-to-end encryption uh, and going a bit mm-hmm. deeper. So someone is asking, yeah. do you think we should be mandating open source and end-to-end encryption for video software? It seems like Ditsy is the only solution that does group video and meets those criteria today. If not, how can users trust that the company is not snooping for corporate benefit or for the government mm-hmm. of the trusted yeah. sectors? Yeah. I think the reality is that if you want to be certain that something is encrypted end to end, you need to have at least that the encryption part of that service to be open source, alternatively being peer reviewed by a panel of of experts who are trusted. But even that is not, you know, I would say it's not as secure as having that part part uh, open source. 
Um, so, I mean, that's that's what I can say. That's like, and then the question is like, is that something we should mandate or not? I mean, it's like I think that. Um, yeah, I think that you will. Um, you know, there are. You know, we have all kind of you know read about. You know the discoveries that Snowden did. Um, so we know that governments are having capa capacity to, you know, to, you know, to listen into what we say and, and what we do, and not only through the communication layers, but they can probably get into your computers. And so then, if you so, everything is used as weak as the weakest link, right? So then you need to then think through. Okay, what about your end device? What about the operating system? And so, so, so it's not as trivial as as that. That is just like let's fix the end to end com communication. Um, but I think that you know it, the reality is like if you want to be certain that you are that you are safe, you need to have kind of open source. You know when we. When we created Skype, we we I think we we're probably the, we were the pioneers of end-to-end -end encryption in a commercial closed source um, uh, uh, communication service, and we did that because because we had to because our communication went through other was a peer-to-peer -peer communication. So if 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 uh, you and I had a communication, it might go through. It's very possible to go through a third-party end user. So if you didn't encrypt that person could just sniff our traffic and listen into us. So we thought it's like, we have to. And then, of course, then you have government agencies coming to you and say, well, uh, we need to help you to kind of, uh, we wiretapping because there are some terrorists or some criminal gangs. And, um, and, and we couldn't really do anything about it at the time uh, because, it, because of, we had en encrypted service. But... For, we, we also know that there was a lot of uh, activists out in the field who use Skype and relied on, on on Skype to be secure. But you know, I know that some people ask me, and I could only give them my word uh, at the time. But if if things are open source, you know for sure it is it is um, peer reviewed. That's I think that's kind of would be if you really want to be safe, then should it be mandated? You know, maybe. Uh, it's a good, good, good question. I think that, but it's also the other thing though is that also that we also have a choice, right? There's so many different alternatives out there, and there are open source communication services that you can use, and they're not as convenient as the closed source ones. And I think that's one of the challenges. But we do have, you know, there are there are alternatives, and and uh, and then you think through it like what what about your browser? What about the operating system and so forth? Thank you. Uh, we are, we are really towards the end of this this chat, but I, I also wanted to ask you because yesterday there was this very important hearing in the U.S. of of the the four big big tech companies, and so I was wondering what were your thoughts when it comes to the concentration and consolidation of the private sector on mm -hmm. the internet. And obviously, like this, this is a bit of a of a biased question coming coming from from us. But uh, do you think that it is jeopardizing internet core values such as openness, freedom, and and permissionless innovation and and resilience? Um, and as we know, I mean, yeah. the some of the tools are even growing in in the current uh, circumstances. So, is this yeah. for you like a, a threat or a jeopardy to to the internet yeah. values? Yeah, I think what, what's happening is that the rich get richer. The, the bigger you are, the bigger you get. You know, you have so many competitive advantages. For the, all those companies have huge advantages with regards to data. I and mean, I would say maybe Apple is different because they're actually making money from selling your, they're charging you, you buy a device from them and you actually pay them money. They don't make money from primarily from, from your data. But all the others are, well, Amazon you buy things from also. But I think that, it becomes hard to compete head to head with those companies. Um, I think we need to be really careful when we say that, when we, when we ask, if we make a statement that that the fact that there's so much concentration that it undermines 
those fundamental value of, of uh, openness because it's not because there are only because that you have these platforms that so many people are using doesn't mean that the alternative is not there you know there are plenty of alternatives for completely open services um, uh, uh, and anyone is free to innovate you know they the existence of these big big the fine companies are not kind of making it harder in harder to innovate um you know they're also providing a lot of great tools for for people to use you know to 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 innovate it might make it harder to compete you know head to head with them because they have so much resources and there's so much advantage with with data but i think that i i i would think that the 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 problem is more of that that there are a few companies which you know so many people in this planet are using so when something goes wrong with those companies it has a big impact on on uh, uh, with their algorithms that they have you know the spe- specifically the social networks when those algorithms are have too much bias it doesn't have a small impact it has a global massive impact but i don't think that um, that doesn't undermine the fundamental kind of values of of the early internet that was you know where you could have permissionless innovation because that still exists thank you niklas i'm afraid we've come to the end of this chat maybe just to to wrap up i think we've got like a minute or two um i know that uh, some people in the chat have been asking also about like ai uh, you know technologies mm-hmm. and so on but you also like you're an innovator you're a you're a, a founder you're a funder so what should we be excited about like what what do you have your eyes uh, yeah. on at the moment and what do you feel comfortable yeah. sharing with in terms yeah. of yeah uh, you know so, yeah so i think that you know we, 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 we by all means we, we really need to be worried and we need to scrutinize what's happening with ai and and how that can because there's so much biases that were which uh, were machine learning are being used because and and then you're using data set that has bias and then that that just automate that 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 bias and 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 escalating it so that's something that we need to be worried about we need to kind of work on that but i would also say that it's not like ai is ultimately just bad ai is like it's 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 the most powerful tool that that we have to our disposal to to innovate and the things that i'm really excited about if i think about the next 10 year cycle with technology is that i think that we will make huge huge progress in healthcare in 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 preventing cures and treatments for diseases that we didn't think about that we couldn't do today um i think that's that's so so that's something we need to make sure that whatever we do here we talked about stifling innovation whatever we do to protect our privacy we also need to make sure we can uh, innovate the other thing where i think where where technology will have a huge impact is also combating climate and um, you know there are more and more companies because that is really the biggest challenge we have in front of us and there are so many companies now the founders are building companies which are using technology to pr- provide products and services in a way that is 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 replacing old old ways to do things in in a climate neutral way so that's something that i'm also very excited about but at the same time we really need to work with companies and ensure that from the early days when they're being founded and the early days of the kind of the formative years of companies that these founders are building cultures and value sets that are inclusive that are respecting fundamental rights and thinking through who are the stakeholders that can be affected by our service and what is so encouraging is that you know now founders young founders are building companies today they look at the big tech companies they don't today they don't say oh i want to build the next facebook i want to build the next youtube they say like they want to build a company that is also learning from these companies both what those big companies did great because they did all the great things but also some of the mistakes that they did because they didn't get the right advice early on and very much about that is building companies which are thinking through all the different stakeholders in society whether those are third party maybe consumers uh, you know 
others, you know, the, the, the society and planet. And that's something that young founders now are responding to really, really well. So that makes me really excited about that the next generation of tech companies will be much more inclusive and they will build cultures which are fundamentally much more inclusive and, and uh, respectful of all different rights. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for ending on a, on a positive and somehow like hopeful note when it comes to the technologies that are coming next to us. Uh, I encourage everyone to keep those conversations in the various forums that are available to the RightsCon community and beyond. And Nicholas, thank you so much again. Um, it was really uh, helpful to hear your thoughts and, and your perspective on all of those complicated issues. So thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you so much, Melanie. Yeah. Pleasure. <laughs>